Thank you. Just a reminder to please stay on mute um, unless uh, you're speaking and uh, to remember to unmute yourself if you need to speak. Um, okay, so today's session, uh, I'm Martin DiMaggio. If you haven't, nobody, if there's anybody here that hasn't met me before, I'm one of the leaders of uh, Spinoza Chavura, um, and I'm on the leadership course for the Society for Humanistic Judaism. And today we're talking about adoption versus conversion. So uh, can I ask somebody to please read three of these, and then I'm going to get somebody else to read another three, and then somebody else to read an, uh, the last four. This is um, the United Synagogue, uh, which is the UK's modern orthodox denomination. And this is their criteria uh, or the process when somebody wants to uh, convert to Judaism through modern orthodoxy. So can I have three volunteers? I'll read. Thank you. I can read. Great. I can uh, read. And another, great, thank you. Um, Go ahead. Shall I go first? Whoever wants to, it's fine. Okay, I'll go. Mm -hmm. um, so for the United Synagogue, Modern Orthodox, um, number one, discuss with local rabbi. Number two, write a letter to the Beth Din describing background and family and explaining why interest in converting to Judaism, discussing any experience of Jewish practice and custom. Number three, initial assessment of suitability for conversion based on contents of letter. Thank you. Before the next person continues, does anybody not know what a Beth Din is? Beth Din, Beth Din, anybody not familiar with that? I'm not. Okay. Does anybody else know what it is and want to tell uh, Nicole what it is? Uh, um, I'll go ahead. I think Gabriel, were you? Oh, okay. So I'm um, gonna say. I'll say something. Uh, so uh, Beit Din um, means house of judgment, and uh, it's the 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 three uh, person panel that um, uh, basically you go before uh, as kind of a final step of conversion, um, mm -hmm. and they ask you questions and and. Uh, determine if you, if it's appropriate for you to complete your conversion. Yeah. Um, there was another term that was used for it in the Judaism Unbound um, podcast. Yeah. Instead of instead of Beit Dean, it was something else. And I wanted to ask what, what the other term that they used meant. Yeah, I can't remember what the other term was. But yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, anyway, thank you. So it's the panel of rabbis um, to which people need to write, according to modern orthodoxy, uh, they would need to write their letter describing their background and family and explaining why they're converting to Judaism, et cetera, et cetera. So it's like the panel of judges. Yeah. But, but they do other things than, than yes. conversions. They, it's the basic Jewish court. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. So uh, the next person, can you read the next three? Yeah, I can. Um... <clears throat> Number four, applicant sent formal application form after which Beit Dean invites applicant to interview. Beit Dean will suggest reading lists and syllabus to enable applicant to learn more about Jewish faith and will advise candidate how to become more involved in Jewish communal life. Beit Dean will ordinarily recommend applicant begins a course of study with private teacher drawn from Beit Dean's pool. Thank you. And the next seven, Beth Dean meets with applicant at regular intervals to review their progress, requires tutor, provides progress, progress report, live in community with viable or vibrant Orthodox Jewish infrastructure where Orthodox Jewish practice can be observed firsthand, precondition to proceeding with conversion application, live with approved Jewish family normally for a period of at least six months, enables convert to experience practical Judaism from within a Jewish home. Do you want me to go with 10 to Martin? Yes, please. Yeah. Process irrevocably completed with convert immersing themselves in mikvah, ritual bath, and prior to that, undergoing circumcision for men. Yeah, great. Thank you. 
Uh, so orthodoxy has its own set of rules about who is a Jew and who is not. This is not that much different from the process of naturalization in the, in the United States. In order to become American, one needs to pass a set of tests that demonstrate a knowledge and understanding of the history and principles and form of government of the United States. If successful, after formal interview, one then totes and takes an oath of allegiance at a ceremony, a ritual that makes one American. Okay. So we're just going through these uh, three different types of uh, Jewish conversion, quote unquote, conversion processes. Um, so can I have another three um, volunteers, please? I can read. Great. I can Go read. Go ahead. Go ahead. So attend services for a few weeks, meet senior rabbi for formal interview, and begin Jewish preparation course. Meet with uh, sponsoring rabbi at least once a term, become part of the community and participating events, match it up with buddy who can help and advise and be friends through the process. Thank you. I'll go, uh, I'll read the last four. Uh, meet again with sponsoring rabbi for final interview. Sent to Beit Din uh, to talk about Jewish journey in front of three rabbis. Go to the mikveh, ritual bath, and circumcision, men. Welcomed back at synagogue with an admission service. Thank you. So this one has an interesting last um, step which is after the mikveh and circumcision. For, for Orthodox, that's mikveh and circumcision, that's it, done. Um, for reform, there's an admission service. So anybody that's gone through that process, which is slightly, the preparation course tends to be more a group of people doing it together. And then they all, uh, I mean, this is in the UK, but I think reform Judaism in the United States is very, very similar. Um, so they'll all have a kind of ceremony together. So that's kind of one of the differences there. Um, can could somebody admit Adam? Thank you. Okay. And can I have another th three volunteers, please? I can read. I'll Great. I'll read. Thank you. Okay. Uh, so for the Society for Humanistic Judaism, connect with a humanistic rabbi, conduct research on humanistic Judaism uh, slash devise an individualized learning plan and become a member of SHJ. Okay. Um, write a statement about your journey. Choose a Hebrew name which ties you to our heritage and culture. Receive an adoption certificate and live out your authentic Jewish life as part of our humanistic Jewish community. Great. Thank you. Does anybody want to look at any any one of these reform, humanistic, or orthodox criteria again? Does anybody want to recap any of them? Would it be possible to recap it for me, please, as I'm so late? <laughs> uh, yes. Um, so number uh, so orth Orthodox United Synagogues in the UK was discussed. The process was. Uh, yes, Aaron. Aaron's got his hand up. Yeah. Yeah. I, I just wanted to say that um, all of this, of course, depends very heavily on who the rabbis that make up the Beitin are. And that in any scenario, you have three rabbis and they can all have wildly different opinions and you can be wildly different. Uh, they can be as different, strict in different ways. And so it's it's very fluid. That's all I wanted to say. Sure. Uh, these are the official criteria um, for the movements. Um, so the baked in, the rabbis on the baked in, they have to, that's very true, but they also do have to adhere to the criteria of their movement. Does that make sense? 
Of course, of course. I, I just wanted to throw that yeah. in as, as an additional yeah. thing. <laughs> Keep in mind. Yeah, sure, sure, sure. Yeah, yes, yes. So for, for modern Orthodox, um, you need to, to begin the process of conversion. You need to discuss it with a local rabbi. You need to write a letter to the Beit Din describing your background and family and why you're interested in converting um, and discuss any experience you have of Jewish practice and customs. You need an initial assessment of suitability for conversion based on the contents of your letter. Uh, an application form needs to be sent, um, which Beit Din then invites you, uh, after after receiving it, they invite you to interview. Uh, the Beit Din will suggest a reading list and syllabus, uh, which will enable you to learn about Jewish faith and will advise you on how to become more involved in Jewish life. Um, the Beit Din will recommend that you be in a course of study with a private uh, teacher, that they have a pool of them. Um, they, they, they meet with you at regular interviews to review your progress, and they require that the tutor provides a progress report. Um, you need to live in a community with a vibrant Orthodox Jewish infrastructure where you can observe and participate in uh, Jew Orthodox Jewish life. This is a, pre, a precondition to proceeding with the conversion application. Normally, you need to live with a Jewish family for a period of six months. Uh, this enables you to experience Judaism from within a Jewish home. I know that they have uh, flexibility for personal circumstances there. Um, and uh, your process is irrevocably complete, completed once you've immersed in mikvah for men and women. And um, yeah, for men and women. And uh, that if you're a man, you need to undergo circumcision. Um, so that's modern orthodox. For Reform Judaism, you need to attend services for a few weeks. You need to meet your senior rabbi for formal interview. You need to begin a Jewish preparation course. Meet your sponsoring rabbi once a term. Become part of the community and participate. And you need to be matched up with a buddy who can help and advise and befriend you through the process. You need to meet again with a sponsoring rabbi for a final interview. Then you are sent to the Bet Din to talk about uh, your Jewish journey in front of three rabbis. And should they accept you, uh, you go to the mikveh, and if you're a man, you get circumcised. And then you have an admission service back at the synagogue with the people that you uh, did your Jewish preparation course with. And for Society for Humanistic Judaism, you have to connect with a humanistic rabbi. I mean, first of all, you don't have to do this for humanistic Judaism. You can identify as Jewish, and that's good enough. But if you want to go through a formal adoption process, this is what you need to do. Uh, conduct research on humanistic Judaism or, and devise an individualized learning plan, become a member of SHJ, write a statement about your journey, choose a Hebrew name, which can tie you to our heritage and culture. Then you receive an adoption certificate and you live out your authentic Jewish life as part of our humanistic Jewish community. Um, so this is a video, a short video, which is, so, I'm, sorry. Sure. I'm sorry, it, I clicked it too soon. This is a short video clip from the um, the video that was in the link that, that you received, um, which is the adoption ceremony of Jared Mariska. So Jared and I had a very interesting conversation about the name that he would take. And um, we considered a variety of names and discussed the meaning of those names. And he had a particular attachment because your grandfather, mm -hmm. his name was Daniel. And so we talked about Daniel and how it ended with the name of God. And I said, you know, this has meaning to you, so we're fine. And Jared said, no, no, doesn't work for me. <laughs> so Jared came up with this. And I will say that those who join the Jewish people have an opportunity to take a Hebrew or a Jewish name. And Jared chose the name Zamir because he is a singer. And he told me he was a singer, but now I'm sitting next to him. <laughs> and he, you have a beautiful voice. So Zamir is a wonderful name for you because your heart sings and your smile sings and your voice sings, and we are so privileged for you to be singing with us and for us. 
So according to uh, Jewish law, a convert is required to go to the ritual bath, the mikvah, we've had a lot of talk about this, to symbolically wash away one's identity and be reborn as a Jew. But in humanistic Judaism, you do not lose your past identity or your family and you are not reborn. Rather, you are adopted into the Jewish family and are enriched by the Jewish way of life. So, I'm going to ask you, these are from the core principles of uh, the Society for Humanistic Judaism. Judaism is the historic culture of the Jewish people. We see Jewish history as a testimony to the continuing struggle for human dignity. And like the history of other peoples, as a product of human decisions and actions. We create and use non-theistic Jewish rituals, services, and celebrations that invoke the ethical core of Jewish history, <laughs> literature, and culture. We make ethical decisions based on our assessment of the consequences of our actions. We each take responsibility for our own behavior, and all of us take collective responsibility for the state of our world. So I will ask you, do you affirm with an open and joyful heart your commitment to these principles and our community? With great joy, I do. The who is a Jew statement of the International Federation for Secular Humanistic Judaism that we adopted in Brussels in 1988 affirmed that a Jew is someone who identifies with the history, culture, struggles, triumphs and future of the Jewish people. So Jared, you affirm with an open and joyful heart that you identify with the history, culture, struggles, triumphs, and future of the Jewish people. My heart does. So we are so proud to be able to give you the certificate of affirmation and welcome. It's signed by the three of us. Jared asked that all three of us participate in the ceremony. And um, we're just so proud that you are part of us now. So I'm going to ask you to respond to all of this wonderful and emotional things that we're doing. <laughs> okay. Um, so I'm going to in a minute ask people to discuss what are the advantages and disadvantages of these three approaches that we just read together and I need us to be in um, breakout rooms for this. Uh, see how we do this. Uh, is it in the more? Okay, I'm looking at it now. Uh, breakout rooms. Breakout rooms. Create, what do we say, five of them? Yeah, sure. Create five breakout rooms, assign automatically, include co-hosts. Yes? The co-hosts? Uh, no, will... no. No? No. Okay. So I'll we'll sign automatically, and then we'll figure out what we want to do afterwards. Sure. Is okay. it clear to everyone what you're doing? Pardon? Is it oh, clear to everyone what we're doing? Yes. Is, it, is there anybody? So we're, discuss not there? we're discussing the three approaches in the breakout group. Is that right? Yeah, the advantages and disadvantages of the three approaches. Yeah. Okay. okay. Right. I'm ready to create the rooms if everyone's ready. Yes. Sure. Yes. Open all rooms. It, it, are are you seeing? Okay. Hello, everyone. Um, Hi. Hey, uh, how did that go? Okay, well. Yeah? Yeah. Yeah? Can I have um, a volunteer from one of the groups to tell me about what you discussed? Let's, shall we look at the advantages first? The advantages of either of the approaches. Um, one of the advantages we talked about, the advantages with the um both the orthodox and the reform is the ritual that one person brought up that um with the secular humanist there isn't as much 
ritual or ceremony in the conversion ceremony, I mean, in the adoption, adoption ceremony, and that that's something that might be missed. That's a disadvantage. That's a disadvantage. That's an advantage of the other two. An advantage of the other two, yeah, exactly. So ceremony. Yeah. Who who were you with in your group? Um, Jamie and um I'm so bad with names, I'm sorry. Me. Uh, yeah. Casey. Casey. <laughs> sorry. Casey. That's no okay. Problem. Okay. Yeah, I and, said that. Um, I, I really like the ritual and so that's the only thing I'm missing in this in the secular humanist. Mm. Is that I like yeah. that, but I would yeah. think they'd be able to create a ritual that yeah, if you wanted you one. Can. Yeah, <laughs> uh, and another group. Well, I can go um, ahead unless you want to go. Oh, Catherine can go. You can go ahead. Oh, can you tell sorry, us who you um, were with in your group? Um, I, I was with Rebecca and Val and um. And one other person whose hey, name Heather. I'm sorry to have forgotten. Oh, it's Heather. Heather. <laughs> yeah, it's okay. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um. Well, we we discussed how um. The Orthodox process, in particular, seems to make you more like indisputably Jewish, whereas um. The humanistic one seems to make Judaism more accessible to more people. Yeah. Yeah, exactly, yeah. Any more advantages? Um, I, think um, in I was in the reform. Oh, go ahead. Sorry, I didn't mean to interrupt you. But like in the reform, I think I do like the approach of going to a few services, like in the beginning and going to like the temples, you know, community events, I think is a good way to kind of ex get some exposure to kind of see if this is like the path you really want to take. So I think you have, it's a good way to start, you know? Yeah. Yeah, indeed. Yeah. And a another group. Well, I was in a group uh, with Adam, uh, Nicole, and uh, Luigi. And Luigi mentioned something interesting uh, that in Brazil, apparently, he said that there's a lot of people who want to become Jewish, but who have really zero clue about what that's really about in the sense that they just kind of want to become part of the, and Luigi, you can correct me on this, but they want to just become part of the chosen people in a sense, but have no no bearing at all, you know, what, what Judaism really is about. Um, and yeah, for just, me, just like, yeah, you know, just because um, in the humanistic Judaism um, kind of theology, we can enter easily the Jewish people. So because of the some um, Christian people that I know, some evangelical people here in Brazil, they want to become humanistic Jews, but just to enter the chosen people and to uh, be part of the holy land and holy people, you know, kind of doesn't make any sense, but because yeah. it's really easy, just self-identify. And I, every single time I say to them that it's not that easy, that you have to study beforehand to identify with something because you cannot identify with anything without knowing the philosophy or theology or I don't know you have to study beforehand you know mm. yeah so is that that's an advantage of all three then because all three have a requirement to study if you want for yeah conversion or adoption yeah um, are there any <laughs> other advantages in your group <laughs> Well, uh, yeah. we, we looked at the, you know, just the, the, the orthodox in a sense, because when you make it, I mean, one of my kind of thoughts was uh, when you make it difficult, like, I mean, the orthodox route is it's much more difficult, right? <laughs> you have to, I mean, you have to live with a, with a Jewish family for, 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 for six months. And Nicole said, you know, I have two children. I mean, how am I going to live with, a, with another family for six months? But I mean, when you look at from an anthropological standpoint, I mean, a lot of 
a lot of societies have these initiation rites, you know, for all kinds of things. And often, you know, the more difficult they are, the more, you know, meaningful often. I'm not saying that it's always like that, but the more binding or more bonding maybe it can become. And if it, if it oh. makes it too easy, then it's kind of like, oh, yeah, I'll just try this out a little bit or I'll just kind of, you know, flow through this kind of a thing or whatever. So I think... I think there's also merits to putting a bar up high. What that bar is, you know, is, is open. But I think it's, uh, I, I looked at some of the videos. Unfortunately, I missed the first few sessions, but uh, you had a really interesting conversation, you know, about, you know, the individualistic, putting the individual, the human rights element in the center versus putting the, the historical definition of being Jewish, kind of the collective element, right? And I think yeah. this is the this is the tension between the two. And I don't think there's a simple I, I, I don't even know if there's a simple way of saying, you know, this is right or this is necessarily wrong, but it's a question of what do you put primacy on? You know, is it is it individual rights? And if it's individual rights, if it's individual self-determination, then it's clearly, you know, going the one direction. And then if it's the other way, sure. then it's going another direction. So I see pros and cons on both, you know. Sure. And that's exactly, it. yeah. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, I agree. Um, so another group, uh, Gabrielle's got, you've got your hand up. Maybe you could speak for the group that you were in. Well, uh, if no one objects. Um, yeah, Who were you with? Um, Who were you with? We were talking, uh, I was with Madeline and with Simon and with Aaron or Aaron. I don't know how it's pronounced. Um, but uh, we were talking about the advantages of the different ones. Uh, it was mentioned that uh, living with a family, in, even though it might be uh, logistically, you know, a step uh, that can be hard, but it means that you can learn the orthopraxy. Uh, so that's a certain advantage, at least about the practices, so especially mm -hmm. when you do not, uh, when you're not, uh, immersed in a place where you can uh, or you don't come from a place where you have learned uh, or seen those uh, what it involves to uh, be a Jewish mm. uh, the reform one uh, is more open and and it's welcoming to anyone who has you know uh, supernaturalistic uh, uh, views uh, so if you believe in God and the soul or, or any of that, uh, you might be, is it, I, I don't think it requires you to be, to have those beliefs, but no. uh, it's welcoming for that. Uh, and it can or it cannot mean, uh, you know, cutting away with your past, depending on the, on the, on the congregation and rabbis mm. that you get. So the big advantage about for me about uh super uh the uh, humanistic one is that first of all it does not uh shower you with super super naturalistic uh uh liturgy at all and uh so that's great for me <laughs> but also mm. that it uh welcomes people because it's an adoption process again it welcomes people uh as part of a family, <laughs> but mm. it doesn't mean that that it requires you. You will never be required to by any rabbi or anything like that yeah. to say, "Oh, I'm done with my practices or my mm. my family or my family name or whatever." I mean, adoption of a name is great, but saying my the practices of my parents is are are I have to give up. That's a toll bar for many people. Uh, yes, yes, exactly. For me, I, I, so I think. Yeah. I think I covered everything. I don't know if, if something else came up. Thank you, Gabriel. Yeah. Um. I, we, uh, us three, us four people that <laughs> in three windows. Uh, we we talked about the orthopraxy actually. In, in to a certain extent, because we said that one of the advantages was uh, experiential. And I gave the example of washing, hand washing, which we just call washing uh, in English. 
uh, we say, are you going to wash? Means are you going to wash your hands? Uh, and there's a ritual way to do that, right? So different groups have different ways to do that. Um, and so if you were living with a family and being involved in a community, then you would see that firsthand, which for many people has quite a lot of meaning, like those kind of practices, regardless of your theology, actually. Um, and I think we have one more group, right? Uh, I think that, I think there's one more group because the uh, Rafael. That was that was me, uh, Rafael, and uh, Liz, and yeah. um, uh, there was a couple of in insights that came out of our um, our conversation that I like. I wanted to share. First was that Rafael was asking a number of different questions about, um, for example, he asked like, um, you know circumcision in in humanistic judaism like mm. it, you know it's not a requirement but is that something that people do and i i said well i i suppose if you wanted to you could and he asked if there was a moil i think that's the term a moil uh you know to that could perform it and i was like well no <laughs> there's not going <laughs> to be a, there's not going to be a humanistic moil but perhaps you could find that with you know, one of the other movements with one of the other um, branches of Judaism, somebody that might be willing to perform that for you if it's that important to you. Um, and he asked about other things as well. The culmination of his questions was that he was like, uh, he was like, so basically the focus of humanistic Judaism is really um, on, because he also asked about if there's a Beit Din or not. And I said, no, there's not a Beit Din. Um, he said, so it sounds like, you know, humanistic Judaism's focus is on individual choice of becoming Jewish and the community choosing to affirm that choice. Um, and, 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 and I, um, I said, yes, that's, you know, that, that's, that's what it's about. And Liz highlighted something that I had noticed myself. Um, and, and that was, um, <clears throat> that, uh, the um the reform or excuse me not the reform but the the modern orthodox requirement of living with a family which has already been brought up uh was uh, that that's kind of a, a an interesting i don't know artifact or whatever as part of conversion um and my comment uh or and she said you know that that gave you an element of immersion into Jewish culture, into Jewish okay. life, into Jewish religious practice. And, and I said that on the one hand, I kind of see that as, as like, you know, advantageous and even as beautiful because it, um, it allows uh, somebody to learn what it means to be Jewish in the pragmatic sense, in the practical sense, in the day-to-day -day sense. Um, and I talk about how when I started with this and I even still feel this a little bit, but not as much, I felt like I was kind of flailing around, like trying to figure this out because I did want to enjoy Jewish ritual and Jewish practices, maybe not all of it, but at least some of it. And I don't have any Jewish friends or relatives that I could turn to. Um, and so, you know, if I didn't have Spinoza, <laughs> uh, mm -hmm. I, I I don't even know what I would be doing. But, um, you know, I, I said so I could see how that would be an advantageous, even beautiful thing. But on the other hand, it, it, it highlights the, the requirement to sacrifice a lot of your own personal identity and who you are and who, who you've grown up to become um, mm -hmm. over the course of your life in order to in order to be accepted by the community, by the rabbi, in order for them to be willing to give you or assign you the identity of Jewish. It's not so much that you get to choose that identity, it's that they allow you to have it. Yeah, indeed. Um, yeah, uh, I would point out that um, there is always, I know um, in modern orthodoxy in the UK, there's always flexibility about living with a family. Um, if somebody had a family and um, or, or didn't for any whatever reasons uh, wasn't able to live with a the family, they would they would they would be flexible. They would probably say, 
okay, well, uh, you need to visit this family on Friday nights or, or invite fam a family and all of these things. So I know, I know that a couple of people have questioned this um, level of intensity about living with a family, but I also know that they are flexible. And that's always the case, actually. Um, okay, so uh, did anybody... Does anybody want to say anything about any of this? Um, any reflections that you've noticed throughout this conversation? It just feels to me like asking someone to give up their identity. It seems, uh, it just seems very harsh. Um, it reminds me though, of a, in the sense of the way traditionally women were expected to give up their, not only their family, but their name, their surname. Mm and become mm. part of their husband's family. Not as I mean, Jewishness, but in every culture, almost every culture. Mm. Indeed, yeah, I agree. I wanted to, to uh, echo that a little bit. I think one of the strengths of the humanistic approach is that we, we are not asking people to give up entirely their old identity. And for myself, that was a big choice when I was deciding which path of conver conversion or adoption I would choose. In the end, the deciding factor was that because at the time I was very involved with a small Christian community um, involved in a lot of different ways. I just didn't believe Jesus was a deity. So that wasn't. But as far as the doing of things with them, I didn't want to give that up. And, you know, I knew from the Reformed tradition, uh, one of the things they ask at the Beit Dean is, do you commit to following Jude J Jewish law and teaching for the rest of your life? to the exclusion of all other paths. And yes. I could not say that because, okay, you're telling me I can't love my neighbor as myself. Uh, you know, there's elements of Christian tradition that I, I, yes, I reject quite a bit, but there's also parts I don't reject. And I, I, I can't extricate my upbringing either. It's there, even if I've, you know, very much chosen a Jewish path. Yeah. Yeah, I relate with them because I am by mom, Jewish, but my dad is a pastor, a Christian pastor, and it was really hard to me to get outside of Christianity because of him and mm. because of her as well, because she she's married with him. But humanistic Judaism just opened opened the doors for me to do it like slow, you know, baby steps before I got into it yeah yeah okay thank you everyone um i'm gonna get us to look at some case studies now um and these are few people um who have had uh, a journey into judaism uh in different ways and can i can i please have um some volunteers uh, some volunteers to read these case studies Just go ahead and read if you're volunteering. I can. Aaron was studying at an Orthodox yeshiva in Jerusalem and was asked to go to the rabbi who asked him about his parents. Aaron's father was born Jewish and his mother converted at a conservative Beit Dean. It seems you may not be Jewish, the man said. Conservative conversions are sometimes kosher and sometimes not. Aaron could continue his studies, but they both needed to research his mother's conversion. Was the mikvah kosher? Who were the witnesses? Were they men, etc.? Does that make sense to everyone? What's going on there? Mm -hmm. what, yes. what doesn't make sense to me is that he was, it, it, wasn't this a person who was attempting to convert? Or was he a person who was attempting to establish whether he was Jewish or not? If he's attempting to convert, then obviously. Neither. Neither. What was the. No, he's just studying at Yeshiva. Yeah, studying at Yeshiva. He was studying and they wanted to ask him whether he was actually Jewish or not. And then they determined exactly. he probably wasn't. I see. I see. Exactly. Because mm -hmm. his mother converted that conservative bait then. Yeah. Okay. So bear that in mind, everyone. And can I have somebody else read this one? Um, Rebecca was born to an Orthodox Jewish father who passed away when Rebecca was nine years old. Her mother is a practicing evangelical Christian. Rebecca visits her paternal grandmother every weekend from Friday evening to Saturday night and sometimes accompanies her to shul on Saturday mornings. 
When Rebecca reached age 12, she decided she wanted a bat mitzvah. The rabbi told her she would need to convert and that they need her mother's permission. Rebecca's mother refused to give permission and problems ensued in their relationship. Rebecca did not convert, but found a reform community, which she started attending regularly when not at her grandmother's house. When Rebecca reached legal adulthood, she approached the reform rabbi, a woman, about converting. She had a few meetings and went to the reform bit din where they said, we will not convert you. Rebecca was disappointed and asked why. Because you're already Jewish, Mazel Tov. They issued her Jewish status papers. Is that clear what happened there? Yes. Yeah. Uh, the reform uh, movement recognizes Jewish patrilineal descent. Exactly. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. Someone won't recognize you if you didn't grow up practicing being Jewish, but she did, so that's cool. But if you're not and you're still lineal, they won't. They won't always take that. Exactly. Yes. Indeed. Mm -hmm. And I was at Limud, the the Jewish conference slash festival for for um four days where i got covid um uh, over christmas <laughs> in the uk our jewish christmas tradition is limud um and uh, there was a reform rabbi from the united states there who said um if somebody came to her in this kind of circumstance she would uh in in terms of uh, somebody who was patrilineal jewish uh whose father was jewish she might still require her to go through the conversion process if she didn't grow up practicing Judaism. However, if somebody came whose mother was Jewish, and if this was the other way around and the mother was Jewish, uh, she would accept her straight away. And somebody in the room who was a patrilineal Jew was very angry with that response. And I said, so somebody can grow up an evangelical Christian and just because their mother is Jewish, then you're saying that they're Jewish, but somebody can grow up Jewish uh, because their father is Jewish and you'd say that they're not. And that was very uh, uh, confusing situation. Yeah. yeah. They That's did. how it is where I live. Mm, yeah. very they confusing. did say that, in other words, this woman grew up practicing every weekend. Yes. Her, but, you know, so if you were a matrilineal Jew, but you didn't practice. Yeah. Would they accept them anyway? Is that it's just yeah. because of natural, I see, but the patrilineal one would be accepted automatically had they been practicing. Yes. Not if not. Okay. And in the UK, in UK reform, um, they are now saying that it should be just unilateral. So and, and, under all the circumstances, if you've grown up practicing, you should be accepted. And if you haven't grown up practicing, you need to go through some kind of course. So they would still the, send a matrilineal Jew on a, um, uh, a course like we're doing now. In, in yeah. the U.S., they, the reform movement has a class that's open to both people converting and people who are born Jewish who want to learn more. And I was in the latter category, and I took the class because I had had very little, nothing really Jewish background. Mm -hmm. And I just didn't want to have some knowledge of it. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. But you would be automatically considered Jewish, whereas I've been practicing for 10 years when I approached a reform rabbi, and I still would have had to go gone through no. two years of, of classes and a, a formal con a conversion. That's not fair. Yeah. No. no, exactly. Okay, uh, can I have another uh, volunteer? I grew up with a Sephardic father and a mother who was born to a Christian family, but converted through Reform Judaism. Mike's family were members of a conservative synagogue where Mike regularly leads services. The whole family fairly often attend services at the Sephardic synagogue where Mike's father grew up. Mike is attracted to the Sephardic liturgy and traditions and he's and he in his own home where he lives with his male partner Mike is the religious one and the Shomer Shabbat, Shabbat observant. Due to Mike's deep knowledge of Sephardic customs, he's called on to lead services at the Sephardic call synagogue. Nobody ever questioned Mike's identity, 
he started an art class conversion via the Sephardic Beit Din, and it took him eight months of studying halakha, Jewish law. He knows his identity didn't change, but he did it just in case. Yeah. Any comments? Well, that brings up the idea of in Sephardic uh, tradition, is there both matrilineal and patrilineal descent, or what is it, what's their... No, uh, just matrilineal. Okay. So he doesn't have that. He didn't have matrilineal. Well, she no. she, she converted, though, not through Sephardic but or Orthodox but reform, but they accepted that, I take it. Well, conservative accepted it. Uh, Orthodox did not. But he, nobody questioned him, but he uh, decided himself to convert via the Bet Din um, through study. But it was, I know, I know this person and I know that it was really easy for him because he was well known and his dad was um, a well standing member of the community. It's just that because his mum converted reform, they would. They were members of a conservative synagogue where the mum's identity was not questioned. Um, but he wanted to be involved in the Sephardic uh, community so as, as a prayer leader, service leader. So he converted. It was just easy for him. So it can, do, does anybody have any observations about any of these cases, the nuances of them? What's noticeable about these cases? There's no unilateral decisions among all of them. Everybody's got their own different definitions of what makes you Jewish and what hoops you have to jump through to get to be Jewish. So, mm. and, and it just varies on the level of complexity depending on the movement. Indeed, yeah. Yeah, Yeah, I, I noticed, of course, uh, um, in one of the case studies uh there was a question of the uh witness to the mick the witnesses to the mick for being men mm -hmm. and that doesn't Indeed, seem yeah. fair either well in orthodox halakha uh, you ha your mikvah has to be witnessed by the same sex Ah, uh -huh. so if they weren't, then his mik, then his mother's mikvah would not be valid. Ah, uh, okay. So, but so this, the, mm. they didn't have to be men; they had to be the same sex as the person being mikvah. Yeah, exactly. That makes sense. Um. More or less. Yeah. <laughs> um, also, this is an Aaron converting. <laughs> Has anybody noticed that it's not Aaron who needs to convert? Yes. Yeah. However, if his mother's conversion was not valid, he would have to convert. And that's the writer of Judaism's, the book, by the way. <laughs> so uh, let's look at this final one. Can I have another volunteer? When I first heard of the term adoption, instead of conversion, I felt instant gratitude. Despite not believing in any supernatural power, I do not come, I did, I do not come to Judaism as a blank slate. It would have been difficult for me to part with certain customs I grew up with, which are as much an expression of the dominant religion as they are the local culture of my home, which is dear to me. Those two are so inseparably entangled that I often cannot distinguish between Christian and Swiss from Zurich or general Alpine culture. Giving up these traditions and foods because of their vague connection to Christianity would mean losing a part of my cultural identity. I am happy the humanistic Jewish adoption process acknowledges this and allows me to gladly open my heart to new practices I can incorporate into my new life as a Swiss person and a humanistic Jew. I am excited to be able to participate in the Jewish experience from now on, feeling that I am 
an accepted member. I am so pleased to adopt the practices and philosophy of humanistic Judaism, as well as being adopted myself into the wonderful community. Along with my partner who introduced me to this movement as one he most closely feels aligned with. I want my future family to be rooted in humanistic values and my future children to grow up learning about cherishing their cultural Jewish heritage. Exactly. So there's some important information there about the um, what which people have already pointed out about um, not giving up your own culture. Right? Right. Absolutely. Yeah. Whereas I feel that in this case, it's so unbelievable. You know, it's, I mean, I, I know that that's what happens, but it's, I find it very unethical. You know, um, this person's own Jewish identity, he's at yeshiva, he's, he's clearly, Judaism is important to him. And yet his very identity as a Jew is questioned because his mum converted at conservative bait then. And he may not be a Jew if the mikvah wasn't correct of his mother. So there's a vast difference, I feel, between this one and Aaron, between Fabian and Aaron. Um, and by the way, if anybody knows Joshua, that uh, he attends Joshua Bamford's, um, what's his surname? Silverstein Bamford. Um, this is his wife. So, um, yeah. Um, whereas Mike's is individual. Mike wanted to do this. Nobody forced him to do this. Um, he would have been fine in the conservative. Uh, he was fine even at the Sephardic. He just didn't want any issues at any point. Uh, but there's another interesting point there. Because... Does anybody know if Mike was going to marry a woman, what might, where would he be able to marry a woman? He lives with his male partner. So what would the difference be in, the, in Mike's situation if he wanted to marry a woman? Well, he wouldn't be able to marry as an Orthodox Jew, as another man, as far as I know. No, no, no. well, yeah, that's true. But he, if he wanted oh, to marry a woman, what would... What oh, would if he were to marry a woman, I see. I think he would have to be in whatever, wherever denomination accepted him. Is she sure. Jewish or not Jewish? Jewish woman. Yeah, but but I mean... If the Orthodox aren't accepting him as Jewish, then they, then no matter who he marries, they wouldn't marry him. But a conservative synagogue would definitely marry him, and nowadays might even marry him to the to, the, to his. They do. Male stuff. <laughs> I mean, th this brings up the question about ethnicity. Mm -hmm. um, wait. wait. I better wait on this because I've lost the thread with this other conversation. I'm sorry. Are you sure? Um, well, we're, we're we're sitting here talking about if you're an ethnic Jew and another Hitler comes along, you're toast. Okay, but if you convert with some religion, in other words, Mike is a Jew according to ethnicity of, of that yeah malevolent type. Um, uh, in other words, this is only a religious problem. If you, mm. This is if you are religious, where you can be practiced and where you can be accepted. It really mm. doesn't have anything to do with well, being a Jew, in a sense, See, especially if you have any because, Jewish ethnicity. Because you were talking before about what determines you're Jewish by matrilineal, by patrilineal, if you've been practicing, but, you know, patrilineal, mat but suppose, you know, I'm somebody who was brought up by 100% Jewish, both of my parents, and no practicing, <laughs> absolutely mm. no practicing. Mm. So does that... I mean, she didn't even know the Shema. I mean, I, she, Paul know. 
called me the schmo when I was in I, I told my a joke 30s. about a fellow who I didn't realize was Jewish. He was British. Uh, and I, he said, we were telling jokes. And I said, you can't laugh at these jokes. You're not Jewish. He said, sure I am. So I asked him, I said, prove it. So I said, I asked him to say the schmo. I didn't ask him to drop trow or anything. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> and, uh, and then I told the story to Betty Ann and she said, I don't know the Shema. I can't yeah. to you. I'm now, my, you know, with my mother did. My mother, you know, I had a great grandmother who was religious. There was religion in there. But my parents gave me a, I had a very strong sense of being Jewish and I, I loved it. And I was culturally Jewish, philosophically Jewish, whatever. But absolutely no religion in the house. I mean, it just was not a yeah. part of my life. Mm -hmm. So yeah. to and whom we were, am I considered yeah. Jewish? And I it came as Yeah, so that's a good point because it that's what I'm trying to point out here with Mike's case. If yeah. your grandparents married in an Orthodox synagogue mm -hmm. and your parents married in an Orthodox synagogue, you would be able to marry Mike. I see. Te technically, well, because you're because, However, because she's not religious, she's yeah. a kosher Jew in that sense. Yeah. 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 Well, you. But however, Mike would not be able to marry you because Mike wouldn't be considered Orthodox. So Mike could not marry in an Orthodox uh, community. Right. Does that make sense? Yeah. yeah. So, yeah. but he can marry in conservative, reform, liberal, humanist. Mm -hmm. Um. Yeah, and so it really becomes an issue uh, when somebody wants to get married. So I know somebody whose grand maternal grandmother, he is from United Synagogue, which is our modern Orthodox, his maternal grandmother converted conservative. He was a Hazan in uh, the conservative synagogue, um, the, the cantor. But uh, 30, 40 years ago, they were not so strict about pointing out these things. They would just take face value. Um, but when he wanted to get married, he found that he couldn't because his mother's mother was not halachically Jewish. Mm -hmm. Okay. So. <laughs> um, this is all okay if you if you want to um, uh, do something in Orthodox um, synagogue and be considered Orthodox. I don't want to identify with the Orthodox at all, so. I don't care. <laughs> no, but say you married a Jewish woman and your children wanted to get married and they would have issues if they needed to marry an Orthodox person. Does that make sense? Yes. Yeah. We, 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 we have issues if they were to marry an Orthodox person. But yeah. if I'm not interested in Orthodoxy, I'm not going to marry an Orthodox. If he married a Jewish woman, if he married a Jewish woman, why would that be a problem? There would be matrilineal descent for his because children. Because they need to get married in an Orthodox ceremony. If they needed to, I see. Yes, mm -hmm. that's what I'm saying. Oh. And then it would be an issue for their children as well. Mm -hmm. Their Martin. parents didn't get married. Yeah, yeah. Martin, I'm, I'm not yeah. sure if I'm understanding, but are you saying that within the matrilineal, every single generation? the marriage must be legitimate halakhically. Yes. Uh, I thought Down to was... six. Well, it goes six uh... generations. Wow. Well, yeah. well, okay. well but I... I... I need to... Um, I need to <laughs> apologise to one of my relatives, or, or correct them rather, because we discovered that one of my aunties had an affair had an illegitimate okay. child so through dna we discovered so i sent her, her a message saying congratulations on being a scouser and congratulations on being jewish because she yeah. was a doctor um, she still can be jewish ah uh, yes this is a very very important point you are jewish but you can only marry a convert or another person who is illegitimate according to halakha religious law okay but Martin, yeah, I, I understood. Yeah, I'm sorry. I understood uh, that how you marry is not 
the problem. The problem is how you divorce. I mean, no, the, no, no. the idea of the mamserim, and you're talking about the mamser uh, concept. Yes. Yes. I was taught. I was taught uh, by my mulim. I I went to Jewish school and the Orthodox, uh, air quotes, and but the mulim were 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 Orthodox enough. And the idea was, okay, uh, you're married as soon as you enter into a cohabitation and sexual relationship. So it wasn't so much how you marry, but if you divorce by any other way, but uh, with an orthodox uh, but then, uh, and you remarried, your children would be considered adulterine uh, children. Yes. So they would not yes. they illegitimate by illegitimate in a way so that uh, that you would have to uh, up to six generations you can marry uh, within yes. the the community, which is. Ridiculous. No, that's not true. Because, you can marry. But but here's the thing. You can marry within the community, but who's going to marry you? I mean, I I always saw that it was kind of like uh, um, catch-22, because how can you, uh, for tw uh, whatever, six generations, uh, then come in? You would have to do some sort of conversion process. Yes, indeed. Because, you Okay, so you can marry... But yeah. you can only marry another mamzer. Yeah. Yeah. Or a convert. So in in uh, this person's case, he would be considered a mamzer. Yeah. If they deemed that his mother was not a legis legitimately Jewish. So he could only marry somebody else in the similar situation or a convert. So why does it matter um, because for six generations, your children and grandchildren and their children and their grandchildren um, would only be able to marry somebody of the same status. This is in strict application of Jewish law, which Orthodox communities adhere to. And this is the reason why in Israel, you cannot have a civil marriage. Uh, yeah, yes. and that's the, the thing about orthodoxy. When you say, "Wow, why, why, why do I care? I don't want to care yet." But the thing is, in Israel, there's no civil marriage, and you can't be buried in the in the uh, same cemetery. Yeah, well, uh, you can be while well, you can be buried in a reform, liberal, or conservative cemetery, but you can't be are, married. You can't be buried in an orthodox one. Yeah. So, so it's very uh, there are. A lot of nuances, you know. There Martin, are really a lot of nuances, yeah. Martin, may I ask? So, um, my auntie had an, mm. had an affair and mm. had a doctor. Um, but obviously, it was an affair. It was. It wasn't a halachic marriage or even a marriage at all. So, is she Jewish? Yeah. According. To, okay, I, I I thought you're saying something about the marriage had to be halachic. It does. <laughs> so it, it wasn't a marriage. Children, it, no, it, no, no. There's no marriage, but she's her daughter is Jewish. Yes, that can only marry somebody of the same status, which is mamzer, which is okay. illegitimate. Illegitimate. Wow. So you're only talking about if she had illegitimate. If she had, in other words, if she just had an affair and then married an Orthodox man and went, you know, just sinned. So no, it's still it's still illegitimate. Uh, really? well, well, but the child, not the child, is the, the child, child is illegitimate. illegitimate. Even even if it's not fruit yeah. of the of the affair. So, if you have an affair or a child outside of marriage, according to Orthodox law, okay. your child yeah. is illegitimate, and they can only marry an illegitimate person or a convert. Yeah, but well, we're saying going to just have yeah. an affair yeah. and then. And went on and didn't have any children. Went on to marry halakhically, whatever. What should be allowed to? Yes. Okay. So as long as there were no children, no problem. No, exactly. Just uh, you know, sinned, and that's it. Okay. Yes, 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 yes. Okay. okay. <laughs> is, that, no, um, is, is everyone clear how how complicated no. identity is? And I well, I already, knew, I, already, I already knew it was complicated. Right. So, so this, <laughs> individual, this individual 
who's the product of, of a Jewish mother and uh, an unknown goy. Um, <laughs> Not Jew, <he>, yeah. <laughs> um, her children, are they Jewish? Yes. Okay, right. I got con I got confused. I thought they were Muslim. So, Martin, just just for clarity's sake, my understanding is this Mamzer status is really a different thing than Jewish status. In other yes, words, I, yes. Um, <laughs> and, and but also the Mamzer status, as far as I know, I'm not ah. aware of any Jewish movements except the Orthodox who observe this idea. Um, yes. And so I don't I, I don't think there's any of the other movements to do. But so someone could be Jewish and a Mamzer. Yes. Someone could be Jewish and not a Mamzer, and someone then could be not Jewish at all. Exactly. You can't be a non-Jewish Mamzer. Yeah. <laughs> I, I think the penny has finally dropped. Thank you. Yes. <laughs> yeah. You. So that's been so mad. Yeah. yeah. Right. You, you sold me on it being complicated. Exactly. That's, yes. if, you, that's if you wish to go by Orthodox standards and they are halakhically oriented, and that's why I would never be Orthodox, and nor do I want to be. No, exactly. Well, I I agree. However, these are situations <laughs> that sometimes people have to think about because I know people who are three generationally reform in the UK who are getting married, but when they got married, they decided that they want to get married in Orthodox because they didn't want their children's status to be questioned um, when they get married. So, yeah. So let's just quickly discuss what positive change humanistic Judaism can make in the lives of people like Mike, Rebecca, Aaron and, and Fabien. Um, I, I'm happy to go for another 10 minutes, 10, 15 minutes. Um, we can either skip this and go on to this one, or we can just discuss this for the next 10 minutes. Can I have uh, some people just saying which one they want to do? I want to raise my hand then. Uh, go on. Martin, I'll, I'll, I'll just simply say that um, one positive change uh, humanistic Judaism can make in the lives of those four people is that uh, it'll save them money uh, uh, from having to spend on Tylenol or aspirin, uh, from having <laughs> to avoid the headache of figuring out all of this. Yeah, indeed. Indeed. I do think, though, that most of these people, not Fabian, but um, were making choices that they didn't need to, I mean, they didn't need to make those choices, except that religiously they wanted something more strict. And so you got to jump through the hoops if that's what you want. Uh, certainly mm. seem to be that way. Uh, I can't remember all of them exactly. Well, Rebecca, you know, since she was happy, I guess, at the reform or wherever she was conservative, and they said, you're Jewish, don't even worry about it. I mean, anybody, she, she was okay. Because she didn't try. It's only when you try to become more orthodox that these problems arise, it seems to me. That's, that's all I'm saying. Yeah. Humanistic well, methods would accept it. Life's much easier. Go ahead, you, Paul. Sorry, Luigi. Thank you. The, the humanistic movement would have accepted all of them for who they were at face value without having to question their Jewish identity. That would I have been the problem. I can't see who's speaking. Sorry. It's Val. I don't, Val, hi. Hi. Can you repeat that? I said the humanistic movement, What the positive it would have provided was the acceptance of their Jewish identity, no matter how observant it was, what their background was. So we can provide a positive space and accepting space for all these people who identity is in question. Like Aaron's Indeed. question, identity being questioned blows my mind, but we, it's still a place where we, ex where we accept you for who you are, no matter what level of Judaism you're in. And you can marry. <laughs> yeah. We're not worried about who. Who married when who? <laughs> yes. <laughs> Indeed, yes. <laughs> the Manzo status would not be would not come into question in reform either, by the way. Yeah, I can see that. That makes sense. Yeah. 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 Anything else? 
Yeah, let's go choose your and we have the humanity tourism. I feel that our Jewish people, our people here in the movement, they have a high level of self esteem because they're a hundred percent Jews, um, no matter what. Yes. Yeah, I agree. I also want to point out that for humanistic Jews, you can be as quote unquote uh, observant as you like. If you're non observant or observant, it's up to you. You just have to find a way to make it meaningful as a humanist as well. But if you want to wash your hands the ritualistic way or light the candles the ritualistic way, all of those things, you're free to do that in humanistic Judaism. There's no kind of, nobody's questioning your observance when you adopt it. And that's amazing. I know much humanistic Jews that are like, boom. And it's awesome because we have variety, diversity, and I, I don't know, all people to include it. Yeah. So I know if I can say it, James, um, I believe that I'm correct in saying that you went to a mikveh because you wrote an article about it, right? Yes, I did. And part okay. of the reason for it was I had um, I had done, done was adopted into Judaism through the SHJ. At the time I felt like I really wanted ritual, but at the time I wasn't part of a humanistic community. Later, I got involved with the Reform Temple and there the reform rabbi said, oh, you're completely accepted. No problems. You have Jewish status. But I tell her, says, well, I really miss not going to mikvah. A lot of my friends who are doing conversion class reform movement were doing the mikvah. She said, well, there's nothing to stop you as a Jew from going to the mikvah on your own and having a ceremony as a kind of affirmation of your status. And so I did it and it was a very powerful experience. And I I highly recommend it. It's, 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 a, it's, a, it's a ritual that's not difficult to do. And there's, I, I, to me, it's a really powerful experience. Um, I will throw out one other thing, though, related to this, and that is the issue of, of uh, circumcision is a big deal for many. My son went just went through reform conversion, and when he initially raised the issue of circumcision, which is usually treated as optional in the reform movement, he decided to do it. And I did not like this idea at all uh, for a lot of reasons. But in the end, what he was persuaded by was, was that the rabbi said, well, if you are circumcised now – then if you later marry someone who is more observant, maybe a, someone in the conservative movement, uh, probably wouldn't be orthodox, but conservative movement, there would be no issue with you being accepted there as well. If you're not circumcised in the conservative movement, it might be an issue. And so for him, he decided to do the, do the ceremony from the, just for the, accept, for the sake of acceptance in other movements. Uh, for me, I just it just gave me the willies. I just, I'm... I, circumcision is a concept I've really, <laughs> which is also a really funny pun. Now, <laughs> yeah. but, but but I would say it, it is a good example of that. Often people may choose to engage in ritual, sometimes for their own purposes, sometimes for acceptance elsewhere. And there is some flexibility there for to do a ritual for a variety of reasons. Exactly. Um, of course, it's not a requirement for humanistic Jews at all. And there isn't a humanistic one, but they in humanistic Judaism, if you want to do it, they send you to a doc. They they tell you to find a doctor yourself, basically. Um, I personally, I, I'm I do not agree with it on on infants. Uh, I think that adults should be free to do that if they want to or not. Um, so uh, I was gonna. This was gonna. Oh, this is the wrong one, isn't it? Um, where's it gone? Um. I was gonna uh, have us do this together, but we had such a rich conversation. Um, so I was gonna ask us what adoption connotes, uh, be yourself. Um, uh, I can't see, I can't see it now. Um, yeah, embracing a set of ideas or way of life, uh, being embraced, add to your identity, et cetera. Um, and conversion can connote changing from one thing to another leaving your old self behind, replacing your identity, etc. And I wanted to give an example of a sample certificate of Jewish status that I produced um, for Spinoza Chavara participants. So it says, we hereby confirm that uh, the name, 
is Jewish according to the parameters and customs of Spinoza Chavara, a humanistic Jewish congregation, uh, signed by us, the leadership team, on the uh, on the day and month in the year, whatever it was. And then, for example, three of the leaders' names. And it says at the bottom, the quote from Ruth 116, wherever you go, I will go. Wherever you lodge, I will lodge. Your people shall be my people. And then, obviously, it's in Hebrew and English. Um, and this is generally what most formal conversion certificates or uh, status certificates look like. Um, and uh, there, there you go. So if at any point anybody wants one of these after c completing this um, course, uh, I'd be happy to give that to them. I think we would be happy to sign it. Um, and you would automatically be accepted in SHJ anyway. Uh, so that's just something that I wanted to say I would be happy to offer. Um, and that's everything that I had planned for the lesson. Um, apart from to remind people that there is a task uh, that you need to prepare an essay of no more than one A4 page. I think A4 in the United States you call letter, um, which will discuss the difference between adoption and conversion. Why might the distinction matter for humanistic Jews? Um, and you please use what you learned from the podcast and video and from the discussion in class. And I would like to receive that um, by email on February the 8th. Can that be a Word document? It can, yes. Indeed, it can. I'll just Any, mention that uh, I know that there are folks that, you know, that maybe English is, is a second language or who may be less comfortable in, in written form. So, yes, feel free to write in another language or if you uh, need to do it verbally, I'm sure Martin and I could figure out a way to accommodate that as well. So we, we wanted to be as accessible as possible, but we did want to encourage these exercises as a way to prompt some deeper thinking and some self-reflection. So, yeah. And also, yes, of course, like, um, I, I'm able to read Spanish and Portuguese, so I'd happy to, I'd be happy to receive it in that. Um, also, um, part, part of the reason why I want us to do essays is to give those people that want to have done a bit of extra work, um, after the course is over, it will give them a bit more validation that they've done some of the study, they've done some of the work, and they'll be able to say, I studied humanistic Judaism, I've done some work, you know. Um, and so for those people um, who might need that extra validation, uh, they will receive a certificate having having studied, you know. that Does that make sense? Yeah. Very much so. Yes. Okay, yeah. Does anybody have any thing they want to say i i'm personally happy to stay on the call for a while um but i think that i need to uh offer um people the chance to leave now um and if anybody wants to stay i'm happy to stay to talk i'm happy to stay and and look at those other okay. um topics that uh, that you're going to approach okay great bye 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 See you next time. Bye. 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 I'll see you in a few weeks. Bye, everyone. Bye.